I think if you get more joy and more bikes and people riding them and you emphasize that some leaders, some very smart leaders, are already riding their bikes for transportation, really pump up the visibility of that in a smart strategic way, then that builds momentum. Literally, if we got five kind of surpri surprising, unusual suspects in kind of corporate leadership and political leadership to be seen riding a bike for local transportation, I swear, for like a week, there'd be so many stories and so much I could do with media and just the amplification that we could do of that, that we could make it seem as if leaders riding a bike for pr local transportation was obvious. And that, it's that kind of the behavior, and you can speak to that because that's a behavior change thing, right? It's that nudge or that shifting of the social norm. I feel like it needs to be a shifting of the perceived social norm. And then it just rolls. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is Andrea Learned uh, with the Living Change Podcast, a quest for climate leadership. One of the most enjoyable new podcasts that is out there right now. Uh, each episode, she profiles a visible leader in climate action and social impact. I think you're going to enjoy it. Andrea, welcome to the Active Towns Podcast. Thank you, John. It's so great to be here. Uh, so uh, I love to have my guests uh, just say a few words about themselves. Uh, who is Andrea? Oh, my goodness. When you get to be my age, it seems like it's going to be a really long conversation. But what I will say <laughs> is that I am a climate influence advisor. And, and how I got there is from I was first way back when a marketing to women expert. I consulted on that for a while. That led to me wondering about how people make green consumer decisions, which led me to thinking more about women as green consumers, which led me to thinking about actually sustainability leadership and what women's traits were, what they had to do with sustainability leadership. Long story from there is that I got into writing about sustainability, excuse me, sustainability, and then really started to observe that, write about that, and then got very involved in NGO climate action, uh, starting with uh, COP21 in Paris in 2015. And from then on, I've just been advising on and writing about and commenting on and, and being a presence on social media on climate action with two key emphasis, emphases, how do you say that? With regard to this, what we're doing right now, I started the bikes number four climate hashtag in 2015 and was really, has, have really been focused on cities, bikes for climate in cities. And then the other thing that I do unrelated to this is that I really focus on plant-based food systems transition, kind of along the similar lines, using my influence and my networks connecting the dots with media, et cetera, for advising clients and, and moving the needle. Love it. I love it. And you and I know each other through social media. You mentioned social media there and, you know, the, and the hashtag. And, uh, and, and, and so it wasn't long before we got connected through LinkedIn, through Twitter. And, uh, and, and it really is about you having these conversations and putting them out. Talk a little bit about that transition of uh, the work that you've been doing and the social side of things and having these stories and then deciding that you also need to do a podcast on top of everything else. <laughs> well, I, I'm watching the space and my background, I would guess my deep background is communication strategy. And I would be working with clients and I would be so frustrated that they were really worried, you know, they were unsure or uncomfortable being more visible on social media with regard to the human beings, the leaders themselves, right? So the difference between a corporate or a brand going, we're having an event, we have an announcement, you know, that sort of messaging on Twitter and LinkedIn versus, you know, it's cliche now, but that, that word authentic, it gets overused. But I was looking to see, well, I don't care if thus and so brand is doing that. I want to know that their leader is somehow tied to that you know, so that I can trust the brand better, was not seeing it at all. The other thing I was not seeing is a real understanding of media relations, which also goes back to sending out press releases at the time of the thing and saying, we've got an announcement and expecting that press would give a rip. So I'm also now watching, I was really closely watching the press on on Twitter and, and social media and really understanding how to connect those dots. So it was born out of pure frustration <laughs> that I want to find, so I, I'm identifying, oh, that looks like a leader that really needs to be amplified. So I'd be amplifying them on Twitter and whatnot and going, shoot, I need X number of people follow me, but more people need to see this because they need to know that there are people that are doing this well and they can model after. That then 
became the impetus for the podcast, Living Change. You know, being seen, living the change that you want your constituents to support. Right. And here's the uh, the landing uh, page for the podcast out on your website here. And uh, talk a little bit more about the title of the podcast, Living Change. Yeah. So we went around and around uh, with my large media as my production company. And we went around and around initially with like, what would it be? Well, do we need to call it the climate podcast, et cetera, et cetera. You know, looking for names that were already there. But what was it really about? For a very long time, we were thinking about actually calling it Get Louder because I often say that. I'm like, if you're doing this, get louder about it. Right. And I kind of yell about that. (laughs) And so we really almost were going to call it that. And then I was like playing with the words and saying, okay, we want people to more than be the change. We want them to be seen living the change. And so that's when it was living change. And the second, the kind of part after the colon for that is a quest for climate leadership, which means these aren't your usual climate leader suspects. These are not the same white guys you're going to see on stage at COPs, you know, at COP27, COP28. And so it's a quest for climate leadership in a range of sectors. And I'm pulling out these people and going, these people are climate leaders. You may not have known it, but this is why. And so that's where the podcast came up. And it's been super fun to, to, to interview all these amazing people. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to take a, a step back to your, the, the landing page here on your website too, because there, there's a word that I want to f- hone in on here. And, and that's the, the word that you have honed in on here as well. And that's, visible. So talk yeah. a little bit about why this is so important here. This is you. I mean, this is it. That's why I say living change. I almost like now I feel like the podcast name should be be seen living change, right? So if you are a leader who rides your bike for transportation in your local area, but you're not talking about it, it's almost not happening. And, and the other thing is by being visible, I don't mean wearing a neon t-shirt that says that I ride my bike to work, aren't I a great CEO or mayor? No, no, no. The thing is, you're just building this kind of pattern of being seen. Oh, look, there's a bike in the background. You know, Mayor Hoositz just rode up on a bike. There's a bike in the background. Or, you know, thus and so corporate leader, look at them. They're standing there next to their e-bike or whatever. It's these subtle cues of being visible as a human being leading in climate action. Then, all of your policies and the things that you're trying to forward and build trust around, it's much easier to build trust if they've seen you do it first. So it goes back to that, the phrase that you're, I'm sure you use a lot as well is pedal the talk for crying out loud, you know, be seen peddling the talk. Yeah. Yeah. I love it too, because, and that's one of the themes as, as you mentioned in the, the podcast itself is highlighting people who are doing stuff. And in in some cases, yes, they are leaders. They are city council members and mayors and, and they're, they are leaders within the community. And, uh, and other times it's, it's, it's just, you know, community, it's community members leading and leading by example and getting out there and doing that. And I think that's incredibly important too, from the standpoint of that visibility is that because we're a social species, we pay attention to what we're seeing out there in the environment. And so it's so incredibly important to be able to see others doing it. And I like to always emphasize doing it joyfully. You mentioned it there. You're not, you're not bludgeoning somebody over (laughs) saying, look at me and look at me. It's like, wow, you know, that mayor is riding the bike and she's smiling and she's like not making a huge deal of the fact that she's riding the bike or doing these other climate related um, activities. We focus a lot on active mobility, obviously, as, as, as being that as part of active towns. But you know what I'm saying is like, yeah. it, it's, you know, it, it, talk a little bit about that because that's very subtle because you're not, you're leading, you're being visible, but you're not beating people over the head with it. Yeah. So that's, and, and I think the thing is, is that the joy, some of us forget what that is and what that's like, but even I'll just name two of the people that I talked with. Barbara Buffalo, the mayor of Columbia, Missouri is a great one. She's just like, I ride my bike because it's the most fun way to get, I mean, it's the same thing I would say. Right. And then I think Alex Fish also talked about it because he was riding his kids to school on the back of his electric cargo bike. And it's just like, 
the joy is a thing that we forget as humans to tap into. And, and you can say, ride your bike for climate, ride your bike for this, ride your bike for whatever. And it's like all wrapped in a bow of, oh my goodness, you're going to return to this joy you had whenever you were, however old you were when you first learned to bike and get around and just, well, and I also think one of the other interviews that was so fun was actually the first one with DJ John Richards of KEXP fame, who owns a vegan restaurant in Seattle. That's amazing that everyone should go to. So listen to the podcast, but he, of his own accord, he knows that I've got an e-bike thing. And, you know, we've talked about it previous to my interviewing him, but I didn't even get to the point where I said, tell us about how much you love your e-bike and blah, blah, blah. He was just like, and by the way, right. And he jumped in and he said, Andrea, the thing is, as if I didn't know, you, you know, you pull up to school with your kid on the back and there's this huge line of people, even in Seattle, right. Waiting in their SUVs for miles. And he's just like, Andrea, it was, it's hysterical. When I first got that thing, put my kid on the back of the bike, zoomed out to the Line, waved everybody else and zoomed away. And he, and so anyone who gets on a bike and starts to like experience that, and we know as active towns, it's for local transportation. We're not saying ride your bike for 300 miles to whatever. It's like, no, no, no. Within a two, three, four or five mile radius, you would, it's amazing how much joy you can get from just your daily life if you get on a bike. But to your point, joy, the other thing that I get almost from really listening to KXP is there's a band that I love called Idols and one of their albums is Joy as an Act of Resistance. And and I and actually, oh my goodness, I have one of their t-shirts on today. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I take in their kind of their call. They're very involved in social impact, but the idea is that joy is an act of resistance in everything you do. So joy is an act of resistance in you know, I would say in eating plant-based food and then I, and, and riding a bike for, you know, and then figuring out how to house people, other conversations that I get into on the podcast. So we forget that joy exists. And, but then there are these really interesting ways that are climate action that will remind us of joy and bring it into our lives. And that's huge. And that's a huge part of my life. And I'm, I'm trying to spread that out in these conversations. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you mentioned the, the episode with Barbara Buffalo. Uh, I just found that so incredibly encouraging and inspiring, uh, because of what we just talked about, you know, she's just out there living it. She's demonstrating it. And, um, I, I, I want to say that one of the lines that she had there was just like, you know, just being out there actively doing that really is, is enough of the statement. It's just, it, it is part of it. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. Cause I, I used to, so the interesting thing about Barbara, if you listen to the episode, which you have, but everyone else should too, is that she used to be the sustainability director for Columbia, Missouri. And I've been eyeing sustainability directors um, for a long time and watching them then become mayors is incredible. And right. so she said that she used to be more visible on social media, kind of trying to post pictures and stuff before she was mayor. Then when she was mayor, she realized that she had a t whole team, right? That was trying to promote mayor is here or there. And so she doesn't have to do it as much herself. Um, but also that people are taking pictures of her on her bike and posting them and saying, I saw mayor Buffalo on here. So again, right. It's this reflection, give these, give the community, give anyone who's following you an opportunity to snap a picture of you next to your bike with a big smile on your face, have them posted to their communities. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the other mayor episode that you have out there is, of course, uh, Mayor John Botters from uh, Emeryville. And what I loved about part one of the interview uh, with with Mayor John Botters is that it also is so incredibly important that you don't get pigeonholed as a leader, as being a one subject, you know, person, you know, one topic. And it's like, because you guys spent the entire, basically the entire first episode, first part of the, of, of that interview. And, you know, pretty much bikes didn't come up at all. Yes. Thank you for noticing that. Yeah. And the, the thing that draws people to him, right, is his social media presence, people who aren't living in Emeryville, because as we hear in part one, there's a reason that people in Emeryville love that guy. <laughs> He's an incredible human. Um, but we don't know that from just watching him. So we're attracted to him because he's talking about riding bikes, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get in and you realize his personal story, the background of his understanding of um, being unhoused and, and, and kind of what homeless people are going through. And all of that was just storytelling. Um, and so I guess part of that point is that he he's on social media and he's doing a good job. He's not waving a flag or like spouting some like really boring scripted stuff. He's being himself. 
So then all this stuff comes out. And then he's also extremely comfortable being himself when he's, you know, in, in whatever thing you're talking about. And he, he, yeah, it crosses everything. But it, it starts with empathy. I think he would say it's just about empathy. And right? then it's social justice, housing, climate, you know, all this stuff. He's amazing. Yeah. And speaking of empathy, it, it, it comes to mind that um, it's we're, we're in a situation where we know that we need to move with a sense of urgency. When we when we think about, you know, the, the challenges that we have in front of us with, with climate change. But we also know that a, a large majority, large majority, maybe that's I'm over exaggerating here. Um, we know that not everybody's where we are. Yeah. And so it's really it, it, it we run the risk of uh, virtue signaling and shaming and blaming. And, and and like you said, you know, we have to kind of back off from shouting and 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 being in people's face and 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 creating this dichotomy of us versus them. Um, talk a little bit about that storytelling to try to and what you're trying to tap into with this because that's really when you when you think of it, you know, living change. I mean, we're we're trying to demonstrate through uh, through actions and and living our lives and specifically people who um, ha- have positions where people are seeing them. But talk a little bit about that because I think we run the risk of of kind of coming to a standstill and 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 if if this becomes just another polarized fight. Mm-hmm. Well, you use the phrase naming and shaming. The thing that I talk about a lot is naming and faming. And so we don't partake of the like cesspool of downward spiral of, no, 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 but you did that and you did that and you're, you know, you're horrible and all that stuff. So the point is, is that, and even mine, like if I interviewed, I can't remember, five or six local leaders, I'm elevating those five or six stories I'm naming and faming them. I'm getting them more elevated. So the point is, is to show that it's already underway. There are leaders already doing this. And by the way, we are going to love them the heck up. (laughs) And so other leaders who are thinking about, you know, (laughs) forwarding bikes and and safer infrastructure and and better and active towns themselves are going to see that there are leaders that are getting loved up for this. And that's going to appeal to them. That will appeal to their vanity as a human being and a leader who needs to, you know, feed their vanity. I have to, you know, it's a base thing, but it, it appeals to their communications people because they get a good whatever, right? And then it also starts to make it a lot easier to forward even the remotely minimal, you know, push in a direction of like safer streets or an e-bike incentive or whatever. And so the naming and shaming is a thing. Naming and shaming is what we sink to. Naming and faming is what too few do. I'm trying to show that naming and faming and loving up the few who are doing the thing that we really want more people to do, the more louder we get about them, the more it's going to look like it will be the perceived social norm of leadership. If you're the cool leader, you're going to be seen pulling up on a bike and locking it up and walking into your meeting. And that's exactly what you say with this tweet is that let's make this the U S mayor's social norm. Mm -hmm. And this particular tweet, Mark Gamba, the cool thing about him was he took the risk, right, and was my initial kind of uh, test run podcast interview. And so we did that like a year or something ago as we were getting ready to build the rest of it. So people may have heard that initially, but we took it back and we edited it a little bit and we're re-releasing it because we wanted to emphasize his leadership is incredible. And since then, he's now in the in the House of Representatives in Oregon. And his story, when that when that uh, episode comes out, which I think is pretty soon, in the next week or two, I'm looking back for my producer, um, he talks about riding his bike to Portland City Council because the city he was the mayor of was just a sister city to Portland, Oregon. And he would ride his bike, right? And he'd show up in his like wet, dripping wet thing, you know, just, and he wouldn't say anything. He would put his bike back down and his helmet down and people would just know. So he he made biking a kind of a brand a part of his climate acting brand. And he did that intentionally and he's not yelling to your point. And that's why I think mayors like him, he's a huge, wonderful story. And I'm going to name and fame people like him all the time because I think, I mean, I feel like I'm a one woman show, right? I'm like amplifying all these people and, and naming and faming and suggesting that their communications teams and that any mayor's communications teams and, and anybody in bike advocacy starts to really recognize if they've got a leader that they're supporting, who's starting to, nudge ahead and maybe ride their bike a little bit more, give them some love. 
and that will, it's going to keep the momentum going. Yeah. Yeah. So let's uh, switch gears a little bit and talk, uh, talk about how the normal, normal, <laughs> in, in, in scare quotes here, <laughs> normal <laughs> people who aren't, aren't city council members and aren't mayors, what impact can they have sort of doing the same thing in terms of being visible about mm -hmm. living the change? They, I mean, a lot of them, you know, the people in the bike advocacy community already recognize that by seeing riding their bike by their neighbors, their neighbors are going, oh, wow. You, oh, you know, and everyone's, you make that look kind of easy. Oh, where'd you get that e-bike? These casual questions come out. And I, you know, you, me, a lot of the bike advocacy people we know, anybody we'd ask has probably said, I've converted, you know, 10 of my neighbors to e-bikes or bikes in the last three months, right? Like it just, so each of those things works. The other thing is you may have, you know, a niche group of followers, 500 people or whatever it is on Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera. The same thing. We are all climate leaders for our particular niche or our particular little community. And again, it isn't to be really recognized, not to be loud about yelling about things, right? But to be really quietly and subtly putting off cues that you ride your bike or that you think occasionally about not flying so much or whatever all the elements are of your personal climate action behaviors, then that starts to make a safe space for more people in your community to go, oh, oh that's kind of inspiring. I'm going to try that too, you know, or I'm going to eat one plant-based meal a week or however it works. We all need to be a little bit louder, not annoyingly so, not neon signs, but we need to be a little bit more visible with these changes, like I said subtly, as all these leaders are that I've been interviewing, and we will be building these platforms and we can have each of us as a climate influencer in that way. Yeah. So uh, on your website, you know, under the manifesto area, you've got, uh, you're on a mission for you to be seen living the change. And that's exactly what we're talking about, being visible out there, you know, doing this and, 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 and all that. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned, you know, the uh, visible not being like high viz and 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 all this stuff that we end up, you know, falling towards um, it, because the the dangerization of active mobility of walking and biking has gotten to the point now that uh, whenever there is an unfortunate collision uh, crash and there's a serious injury or a fatality, one of the very first things that uh, the media does is, is like reference whether that person was wearing a helmet, references whether that person was wearing dark clothing. Talk a little bit about <laughs> this because, it, I, because, you know, one of the most, you know, I think one of the most important things we have to do as a movement is, is to stop, you know, this, this incessant sort of conversation about, uh, about that side of visibility and that side of, of, you know, trying to arm ourselves uh, to be able to just exist in our public realm. Mm hmm. Well, it's interesting because actually my dad just shared with me some link, I think, from Germany about scooters being so horrible and and somebody, a biker tripped over, or a walker tripped over a scooter and died and whatever. And I my dad knows my sense of humor and he kind of got me and I got back to him and I just said, yeah, because cars never do that. Right. Like no one's ever appalled that a car ran over somebody on a scooter or, you know, it, it's just it's amazing what that is. And it all made me think I also had a conversation earlier today with some friends at an organization called Covering Climate Now. It makes me think that we need a covering transportation now, right? Coalition, which is we help to be a resource to train media so that they understand it. So we and again, I've seen this in a lot of areas where we get mad at the media. We're going to get mad at the reporter. That doesn't help. Right. What what it is, is becoming a resource and saying, hey, did you realize that blah, blah, blah. A lot of people do it on Twitter, right? They make a correction. I think we could be kinder about making corrections. And I think that we could potentially, and you know, use kind of tag climate media and say, if you're covering transportation, think about this or whatever. The other thing that I will say is kind of related to the podcast is when I was talking with Alex Fish, formerly of Culver City, city council and a former uh, mayor of Culver City, we were mentioning this idea of livable communities, which and you've interviewed Lindsay, right? 
So Livable Communities Initiative based in Los Angeles, but it's a model that everyone can follow. And the whole idea is you it, the car speed, like reducing the car speed, there are so many elements to that, that there's, it, it's bipartisan or it's nonpartisan, right? Like it's, it's like slowing the streets and, you know, all of these things. That is also a training for media, I think. That's a kind of covering transportation. So again, elevate the positives and, and kind of frame it differently. And of course, not dial into, because when we lived, let's say Mayberry, I bring that up and that shows my age, right? There's a, there was a show. I don't even remember. Was it, what was it called? Mayberry. What was that show called? Oh gosh. What was that? Mayberry RFD? I don't know. Anyway, the idea was that Mayberry is this town that's so sweet and it's quiet and you walk down the streets and whatever. It's, it's that, remember that old kind of neighborhood that those of us who are a little older lived in, they have existed Everyone and their brother loved them. It wasn't bipartisan. We didn't know what everyone was voting, right? But we all liked living on a quiet street and whatever. So we just have to help reframe and not get mad at the media, the particular reporter doing that, right? But subtly suggest that. And then really, really highlight all the studies that come out that talk about slowing down the streets. You know, all the stuff that comes out of the EU that Lindsay um, Sturman and all the livable communities people in LA know about, all that research is like, Slowing cars down makes a big difference. It doesn't matter if the person is wearing all black or wasn't wearing a helmet or whatever. Like you, you know, if you were driving slower, you would not be killing people. And so re, but shifting that story again, right? So naming and shaming and yelling at everyone or figuring out the angle where you can name and fame and just sort of start to educate people a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So Mayberry RFD, of course, the abbreviation is for Rural Free Delivery. And that's that what a, that was. Okay. And it was a spinoff from the Andy Griffiths show. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. There you go. May- <laughs> Mayberry. Yeah. You, Mayberry. We're, we're of the, we, we are of the same age. We are. <laughs> so, <I know. laughs> that same age group. And, and I'm glad you mentioned Alex Fish. Again, uh, an absolutely fantastic episode. Uh, folks, you, you have to you know tune in and, and, and listen to that that. Um, and I do encourage everybody to go back and listen and watch my Lovable Communities uh, interview uh, with Lindsay, talking yes. really about the hard work that is going on in, of all places, Los Angeles. Well, and the thing that I loved, because I you know, advised them, you know, I kind of got involved and that's actually how I met Alex. Got, you know, I'm in Seattle. How would I know LA? Right. But I met Lindsay through Twitter and then got involved in helping Lovable Communities during a certain period. And that's how I met Alex. Um, yeah. And yeah, Alex, all the interviews are amazing and anything Lindsay has to say, definitely go back and listen to your episode with that. And I, part of the thing that I love so much about livable communities is that they did frame it as steal this idea, right? So it isn't livable communities in LA and they're doing this thing and good luck everybody else, right? It's, we're doing this thing. We've pulled these blog posts together, you know, what Lindsay's talking about and the research she's done and following people from from there is only going to to help other cities learn. So if you are a transportation person or a bike advocacy person in any other city, dial in to livable communities. Go look at the images they're using. Go look at the kind of world that they're proposing. Steal that stuff <laughs> and give it to your transportation leaders in your cities. Yeah. And uh, I'm glad we, we talked a little bit about that livable community thing and the, and the framing and the images they're using, uh, again, striving to broaden the tent and not have this be uh, the a polarizing conversation of, oh, it's the bike people against everybody else. It's like. Oh yeah, no, what we're talking about here is viable, vibrant, livable places. And I think that's one of the the themes that keeps coming up in your episodes as well. Oh yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, I I keep saying, you know, it's for uh, for the win for everybody. You know, so if you are someone who for whatever reason continues to drive a car, it is only in your benefit that you help make it safer so that people can bike because you have fewer cars in front of you in that line. You know, so Everyone wants fewer cars on the road. Yeah. And I'm glad you emphasized that. Everyone wants fewer cars on the road versus everyone wants to see the transformation of the fleet to electric vehicles. Yeah, which, of course, I have an EV. So, I'm, I mean, I, I am that of which I speak. I ride my bike much, much, you know, for, but I also try not to drive. And then I also am really conscious of not driving into the middle of a busy downtown when I really don't need to and I could ride a bike or, you know, take a bus. 
But yeah, I, I think this is really interesting. Again, the here's a solution for climate change. Let's just convert every single car, you know, and, and now you've seen because the EV that I have is a Bolt. They just announced that they're not going to be in production with the Bolts. And meanwhile, the Bolt is a amazing car, super fast, amazingly zippy. Doesn't, you know, maybe the margin isn't there, right? Because they can build a huge gigantic SUV or truck on top of that same thing and make more money. What the, you know, why are, why are we motivating? Why is a company not realizing that we need, you know, part of what we need if you are going to have a car on the road is for it to be smaller and really just match the task that you're, you know, using the car for. So I, I'm not, you know, I think EV, that story, we need to figure out a way to kind of integrate with that story better and say, yeah, EVs are great, but try an e-bike or a bike first. Yeah. Well, and I think that, and I want to be clear with what I'm saying here too, is that I do believe that we need to electrify our entire motor vehicle fleet. I mean, it, it, every every motor vehicle that is out on the roads really does need to be shifting to a more sustainable uh, energy source. But I would like to see a reduction of the number of motor vehicles on the fleet because ultimately, you had mentioned it earlier, is that we know that a, a very significant number of trips are within easy walking and biking distance. But because of our built environment and because of habit, we just we drive everywhere. We it's you know, and that gets into behavior change, which is my background, is we have habituated driving when we go, oh, two miles down the road, you know? Well, I think too, I mean, it's so easy and it it is a habit. And even when I've turned, you know, turned friends on to buying e-bikes, they're still so afraid. And I, my, my, uh, you know, I, half the time I'm going and coaching them for a couple months and saying, let's ride from your house to the closest coffee shop. Like you just, so starting to twist your brain, you know, or untwist your brain so that you're like, oh yeah, that coffee shop is two miles away and I can take, you know, a one side road over and get there safely or whatever. So it's the local trip stuff, even before, cause I just started riding my bike. I wasn't a bike advocate, advocate person. I just was like, this is so practical. I'm from the Midwest. You know, I was just like, so as I got into this and I think it was Barb Chamberlain who you've, I'm sure you've interviewed Barb, right? Not yet. She, I need oh, to. Oh, Barb. Okay. I'm saying you guys need to talk. So Barb, you have to do it. There you go. So um, she was the one who really started. And um, Melissa, Melissa, uh, why, why am I blinking on her name? Last name. Uh, 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 with Petal Love, Melissa? Yes, Melissa from yeah. Petal Love. She, uh, the bummer. two of them. Yeah, yeah sorry, Melissa. Um, the two of them were early on the ones who kind of embedded that for local transportation in my brain. And to that point, when I'm on, so I have built this climate influence and people know me on various social media platforms. And even now I'm kind of getting onto some new ones and I'm seeing people go, here's my bike from, you know, my ride this weekend or whatever. And, and anybody else have a good bike story? And I just get right in there and I say, yeah, I ride my bike for transportation. And then it's almost like, oh yeah, I used to do that literally. So there are a lot of people who ride bikes for road riding or for fitness who still get into their car for their two mile. And I just like, so in, I'm a little judgy about that, (laughs) you know, and I, and I could fall into naming and shaming for that, but instead, right. Make kind of a joke and go, Oh yeah, I use my bike for transportation (laughs) and just leave it there. You know? (laughs) Yeah. Well, and, and, and one of the things I love uh, about the landing page, the imagery that you have, you know, here on your, your website is, you know, the, these beautiful Electra uh, town bikes, you know, these are tools for utilitarian trips. And, and that doesn't mean that they can't be fun. Of course, they're going to be fun. I mean, you're on a bike, it's, it, it, but it, they're useful. They're utilitarian. You can get stuff done. And I think that's incredibly important to, to realize is that, yes, we can, we can leverage those people who you just mentioned who are using bikes for recreation and sport purposes and, and, and encourage them to, hey, you know, N plus one, let's get a, a, a utilitarian bike into your fleet as well as, you know, you know, I can't tell if any of these are, are e-bikes, but as well as uh, an e-bike or two. Uh, and, and that's a great way to, to, to you know, make it 
enjoyable for all members of the family. So like, for instance, you were just visiting your dad in, in uh, Ann Arbor, you know, maybe it's a situation where you're just fine on an acoustic bike and having him on an electric assist, you know, kind of levels the playing field and you can go for a family ride. We, that's exactly how we did it. Yeah. I, when I was there, I, I rented, thank goodness, University of Michigan has a, a rental program that even alum can use. And I just jumped right in there and I got this regular acoustic bike and it was so wonderful because my dad also is aware that I kind of want a significant ride, right? So he knew that if I had an e-bike and I've done that with him before, but it isn't quite as fun as if I have an acoustic bike and he has his e-bike. It's amazing. Yeah. So fun. Yeah. Go blue. Good, Go good blue. on you. <laughs> gotta get that it's, in there that's right we gotta get that in there so i you, you were undergrad there right i was undergrad yep. and i was graduate that i did mm-hmm. my master's there so mm-hmm. that's good stuff well, what have we not covered yet that you really think we need to to um you know bring up for the audience well i mean i guess i have a question for you just when you're looking at this and and just in general uh your audience may be highly bike advocates what do they you know what do they need to start? How can we nudge them to name and fame more of their political leaders? You know, if they follow me, of course, they're getting a lot of nudges. But are, are bike advocates getting too sunk into negativity? Is there, you know, tell me what you're seeing, because I'm very interested in the bike advocates and how what I'm doing can get louder for them so that the political leaders that I'm trying to really support uh, get their love louder. Yeah. <laughs> I would say that if I'm doing my job well, I'm seeing less and less of my audience being specifically bike advocates. I'm seeing more and more people who are tuning in around the globe who are just interested in seeing uh, more livable communities and and really kind of approaching this from uh, less of a siloed uh, area of we're bike advocacy or this or we're that. And in fact, I even go so far as to, to be quite um, specific in saying that I don't think that a city that, you know, that doesn't have a bicycle advocacy organization needs a bicycle advocacy organization. I say that's a great opportunity to um, to do some advocacy work that's much broader and doesn't have to be focused in on a uh, that uh, such a narrow area of advocacy work. And then I bring up the example of like a livable communities. You know, let's let's broaden this and really kind of embrace bringing in, uh, you know, everybody, including, you know, this concept of safer streets and Vision Zero and pedestrian and uh, ADA accessibility and all of these things. And then it's less of the 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 narrow niche of, of bicycle advocacy. But you're absolutely right. We do we can all think of some of the names out on Twitter where it's easy to get spiraled into hashtag bike Twitter and get real negative real fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I thank you for the clarification on your audience and who you're hoping to reach, uh, kind of broaden the reach even more. And that livable communities, I mean, we keep talking about it. The the truth is, is that just that phrase, whether it's the organization we're talking about, about or not livable communities is completely in alignment with sustainable development goal 11, which is UN sustainable development goals, right. That have to do around climate action. And I, I personally don't think that that one gets enough love. And when corporations are thinking of scope three emissions, et cetera, et cetera, I'm always just like, well, for crying out loud, look at the umbrella of sustainable communities and go to town. Right. And that's really what livable communities represent. And that is exactly to your point of connecting all these silos and saying, you may think you don't care about livable communities because you've only seen it framed as bike safety or whatever, but it's also blah, right? So it's an umbrella for how everyone wants to really live their daily life. So I appreciate that. And I just wish that in the climate space, they could figure out how to really be forwarding sustainable communities because that would include food, right? That would include bikes, transportation, that includes affordable housing, et cetera. So that is part of the mission of me and who I'm representing in this podcast too, because they're usually coming in through social media and bikes, but they're on affordable housing, they're on social justice, health, et cetera. So I, I appreciate that about what you're up to. And yeah, I think SDG 11, sustainable communities, yell it from the rooftops. That's the kind of umbrella framing that we need. Yeah. So you got involved uh, with Paris, with COP21, with Paris. Um, 
two cops ago, <laughs> uh, it was it was brought up that again everything was focused on the electrification of the fleet and um, uh, the the Dutch cycling embassy and the uh, European uh, Cyclist Federation you know stepped in and and others as well to say, wait, you guys are not even talking about active mobility and specifically the the potential of the bike as being an opportunity here, which was just so ironic because it's also, you know, two years ago, we had this explosion of e-mobility and electric assist mobility, which is still skyrocketing right now. The the best-selling EVs on the, on the face of the earth are electric bikes, you know, electric assist bikes and cargo bikes. Talk a little bit about that because there, it, how, how is it that a whole bunch of, of, you know, mostly white, mostly male, you know, leaders from around the globe are still like discounting walking, biking and skipping right to electrification of fleet and fancy high speed rail. I'm pretty cynical about this, actually, because I see it in the food system space, too. The deal is, is that the easiest solutions are too easy and they're they're just like, woo, and they have to go right to climate tech, right, or carbon capture or EVs or, you know, they just. And then the other thing is we have to be realistic that we live in this capital capitalistic society and it's like we want this transition to happen quickly. What makes it happen quickly if someone can make money off of it? Well, the e-bike industry making some money off of selling e-bikes is just not going to scale, right? It won't be big enough. It won't be good enough for investors to make a whole load of money on. So the problem is, is that the solution is too simple that they can't even see it. They don't think it's going to scale. But what I would argue is they're not taking into account that once we rally a little bit of the momentum, right, we start to make it seem as if this shift is already happening. And that's what I'm trying to do by saying, you know, this leader and that leader, they're riding up their bikes around. Why aren't you right? This starts this whole momentum. I think we can point to the EU and the Dutch cycling embassy. They, their leaders, it's so normal for like prime ministers or people in the government and the EU to be riding their bike to work. They don't even think to take pictures. Right. And, and so I think we have to see the social behavior, kind of the behavior and the influence part, which we haven't. But I think if you get more joy and more bikes and people riding them and you emphasize that some leaders, some very smart leaders are already riding their bikes for transportation, really pump up the visibility of that in a smart strategic way, which I'd argue I'm really good at doing, um, then that builds momentum. Literally, if we got five kind of surprising, unusual suspects in kind of corporate leadership and political leadership to be seen riding a bike for local transportation, I swear, for like a week. There'd be so many stories and so much I could do with media and just the amplification that we could do of that, that we could make it seem as if leaders riding a bike for local transportation was obvious. And that's, it's that kind of the behavior, and you can speak to that because that's a behavior change thing, right? It's that nudge or that shifting of the social norm. I feel like it needs to be a shifting of the perceived social norm and then it just rolls. Right. Yeah. Oh, where to go from here? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you, you touched upon something that, that, that it has also come up recently. And that is, you know, why does Hollywood hate bikes so much? You know, and, and it's in the, the, the caricature uh, of this is that, you know, so often when we see, a uh, a person in a TV show or in a uh, in a movie that the caricature is this this person's a loser and they're on a bike. This person is a you know is a is some sort of a clown and they're on a bike. Um, you know, it's like yes, there's joy in Pee Wee Herman and he's on his bike, but you know what I'm saying is that it's just like so part of that imaging and part of this visibility. Um, and, and part of this messaging, you know, it seems like it's not just the media and it's not just come, you know, sort of like what you've been in actively involved with is corporate branding and being able to do this. We also have a challenge in, you know, in how society is being projected out to mass consumption, because honestly, we're both failing if we're just you know, broadcasting these 
episodes out and it's an echo chamber and we're never getting out into the, 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 the masses in terms of out there. So talk a little bit about that. Cause it's gotta be kind of challenging from a multi-pronged perspective, not just with active mobility and bikes, but also some of the other uh, key things that we need to be thinking about from a climate perspective. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a whole organization. I mean, there's a event at the end of June called the Hollywood Climate Summit that I'm involved in and really interesting things are happening and the studios have their sustainability directors. And, you know, and then one of the people that I interviewed for my podcast was Steve Vitolo, who is an Emmy Award winning writer and director who came up with a paperless pledge for related to scripts. Really good episode. Highly recommend everyone goes listen to it. The deal is with Hollywood and writing, it's kind of this, uh, and that's one of the reasons I'm such a big supporter of what's happening with the Hollywood Climate Summit is that if you have these values as a writer or as a production assistant or, you know, as a craftsperson, right? So these aren't the movie stars I'm talking about, right? These are the craftspeople, the people behind the scenes. How do you slowly integrate that? And I do have a fantasy where some guy comes out into his garage and he looks at his very expensive Tesla and then he looks at his e-bike and he goes, oh, I'm just going to the store, right? Or I'm going to go to my neighbor's house. And they, ju- they choose the e-bike, right? And I will say that I don't know what the shows are. I'm not ever, my mind is never that connected, but I have seen more casual use of, oh, this character just went out and rode their bike and more casual, they happen to be eating at a vegan restaurant. So I think it's there. And I think that there's a whole community on the ground um, that's that trying to change kind of that overall narrative, the impact narrative of that. Um, so again, to the influence of that huge influence. And so one of the ways I would say that we can support that is when we see X, Y, Z streaming show really incorporate a bike or the main character gets on a bike or an e-bike, love that studio up, right? Love that writer and that producer, love that whole team up on social media, whatever platform still exists by then. Right. <laughs> um, love, love up the TV shows that are doing that. It's almost like that transition when all of a sudden you Hollywood couldn't show people smoking, right? You, it's like, we want that to happen where it's just, it's not this obvious thing that they get in huge, some huge gigantic gas powered truck, right? It's just like, it's a matter of course that they all go off and get their bikes and somebody goes and takes the subway. Like that's, that's the life that we want to do. So I think that people on the ground in Hollywood are looking in that and that there's a lot of possibility there and we need to support it and amplify it when we see it. So that's our role, you know, out in the consumer sphere is to like go, yes, thank you so much for highlighting that climate storyline in whatever. That's going to get the studios to buy into that more. Yeah, yeah. And I will say that uh, the many of the people behind Livable Communities of Los Angeles are actually tied to uh, the TV production and, mu- and, and movie production industry there in that part of LA. And so uh, it's, I'm hopeful that we'll start to see some some images and some maybe, you know, it, I would love nothing more to your point of not only would it be great to see, you know, major leaders doing this, but like to you know, what you just mentioned as well, seeing major movie stars and, and others, you know, bringing and normalizing this, you know, to, to some, some, to some extent, um, LeBron James has done this because he made a point of riding his bike, uh, you know, to the stadium, uh, and, and to the, the playing ven- venue, uh, especially especially when he was in Cleveland. I'm not sure if he's continuing to do it in Los Angeles. He's done a, a lot to get more kids on bikes. But this is what we're talking about is how do we this normalize is, this and, yeah, and, and, and I think, make it seem cool? So. Yeah. And I think that not that, you know, and kind of for another market, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger has been big on e-bikes and we've seen if he's gotten in an accident or whatever, like there are people are following him very closely on that. But I feel like it's, you know, LeBron James that everyone's watching is the current hip, you know, athlete. It's also Arnold Schwarzenegger that all sorts of people really highly regard as a movie star or whatever, like, but he taking pains to be visible and not, you know, and maybe he's taking a picture and he's next to his e-bike. Like, again, really thinking about being seen doing that, right? So, if, and, and using social platforms. So what was I just listening to? Oh, I was listening to a Green Sports Pod podcast interview with Senator Cory Booker about his being an athlete, you know, and now being a political leader and his using the platform for farm reform and all that. And he distinctly mentions, you know, be really intentional about how you're using your social platforms and who you can influence with that. And I think that that's what any, 
celebrity who wants to be contributing to this or athlete or whatever, just think about how you can make it a storyline that's a through line for whatever your social media sharing is. Because I'm hoping it is for me, it is for you. You know, it's obvious that this is what we do. We're not yelling about it, but we're that person who e-bikes all the time, right? Or we're the person who, and I'm here for it. (laughs) From your experience, what is it about bikes that just there, we have this disconnect with, you know, the climate movement. It's kind of ironic when you think about it from the beginnings of the, you know, the 1960s and 1970s, bikes were central uh, to the original discussions and and, and especially with the uh, the 1972, 1973 oil, you know, challenges that we also had it's just, it's, I'm baffled by it and it's not my space. So I don't really understand it as well. Do well, you have I mean, any insights? I, I mean, my insight would be because I can be pretty cynical and that is that it, it would take us back to a thing that we, what happens now is that our culture drives everywhere. And so the thing that we can change that appears to be the low hanging fruit is that we switch those cars that we all drive anyway to EV. That's it, right? That's it. They don't think as quote unquote big as we do, which is like, rethink the fact that getting into a car at all is the, is the form of transportation that makes the most sense. And so they're taking the easy way out, right? Which is just do that. And it's the same thing with carbon capture, et cetera. So much climate tech is just like, well, we do this anyway. So let's just add a little thing at the end that filters something out, right? Like it's this climate tech rather than going, why do we do it that way? <laughs> and, and that's the thing I think that's really frustrating for me because I know that I don't know the majority of people at some point probably had a little moment where they, you know, hopefully learned how to ride a bike. Right. And we, and everyone knows that there's a, the, it's like when you're 12 or something and all of a sudden you think, I can't wait till I drive a car and off you go and that's it. Why does that happen? And anytime you bring an adult back to it. So my dad as an example, right? He went through a period of time where he tried to ride his bike to work. I remember when I was a kid, and he got too sweaty or something, right? So then he didn't, and then he didn't, and he didn't, and, didn't. and so then he's retired, and he's like in his 80s, and I go, Dad, this e-bike thing, you're just gonna, and he's like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, right? And then I get him on it, and he's like, oh my gosh, right? If I'd had an e-bike, if e-bikes existed, I would have ridden them the whole time, because my dad lives three miles from where he used to work, you know, for 25 years in Ann Arbor. He could, if he, if there were an e-bike, because sweating is his big thing, right? If he, if he wasn't going to sweat, then he would do it. So what are these little things that are holding people back? The e-bike probably solves a lot of them. Yeah. And all of those men. So let's say, for example, at COP28 or something, there are like X number of the same old white guys on stage talking about transportation or mobility. You know, unfortunately, it's going to be in Saudi Arabia again, but it would be something like when it was in Glasgow or, you know you take those guys out and you say, you can't get on stage until you ride an e-bike around Glasgow for an hour, you know, and then you go in (laughs) and you have these conversations. So that's the thing that I'm, I, more people need to be reminded that you get on a bike and it is the simplest solution. And even climate leaders, right? Even big name people that, you know, so-and-so is a climate leader or leads this organization or that organization, or is the head of a big climate philanthropy, they should be talking about how they ride a bike. They should be showing a picture on their LinkedIn thing every once in a while that they rode their bike to the store or whatever. These little clues are like breadcrumbs and they all add up. I think the advertising thing, the advertising take or saying is that you need to see a message seven times, not the exact same message, right? But the message is quit smoking or smoke our brand or whatever, right? You see little hints of that like seven times, it embeds. Right. So if you're on Twitter or you're reading or you're seeing the news and you see one guy on his bike in Europe and then you see a thing on Twitter of your mayor on their bike or you and then you're like, what is going on? Right. And then you're going to start to pay more attention to bikes or e-bikes and go. So it's all these little breadcrumbs. It doesn't need to be some big, again, neon sign. It's all of us doing our part with little breadcrumbs. Yeah. Yeah. I was a little bit shocked that um, bikes as transportation, bikes as climate action weren't more of a theme in uh, the climate book um, by Greta. Mm. Mm. I'm. Have you had a chance to read it yet? I haven't had a chance to read it. Okay. Um, did she talk about mobility or transportation at all? Or it's it's in there. It, it, okay. It's very much a part uh, of that. It, it just it. I was a little bit 
dismayed that it seemed like the, again, bikes just got skipped over. And yeah, well, so, and, and maybe it's a, a function of land use because they did talk a lot about, you know, Hey, we need to be changing how we do land use because we've, you know, and, and this is a global book, of course, you know, the, the, the climate book and looking at globally, but, um, but really it, it seems like there is a huge opportunity to, to try to, to, to realize that, especially from an American perspective, man, I mean, we're talking America here, man, we, we're talking freedom, Right. There's no, there's no better freedom machine than Than being able to jump on the bike and with E E assist, be able to Mm -hmm. go five miles and, and not be trapped into an automobile. I don't know. I think there's a lot of room for a public service camp, you know, a PSA about bikes as transportation, the same way the PSAs used to come out about smoking, et cetera. The other thing I will say is the IPCC climate report I've seen the articles that say basically it's going to be building efficiency, energy, transportation, and food systems. Those are the top four things that if we address them are going to make a huge difference the most quickly. So how any of these books or people can't be going duh about climate, I mean about uh, bikes in a transportation conversation, even if corporations are looking at scope three emissions, it's like, You can count if you help your employees who live nearby use a bike to get to work. Like that counts. So I agree with you that that isn't getting enough or strategic enough communication and it's not in the right rooms or with the right leaders so that they're talking about it on those big stages. And so that's another thing, right, that maybe the bike advocacy world, I mean, could do a better job getting in with leadership. So there's a difference between leadership communication strategy and consumer facing campaigns. And in my mind, consumer facing campaigns that have been happening for forever, all sorts of organizations are doing them. That's fine. It hasn't made change fast enough and we don't have time. And so we need the leaders to ride a bike for a week and then tell us that they wouldn't love to do that again. They're never going to say that, right? If leaders ride their bike for transportation for one week, they're going to be overwhelmed with joy. (laughs) And then they're going to go, holy cow, I need to get the transportation infrastructure better. (laughs) You know what I mean? So that's (laughs) what I was going to say. I I, I would imagine that depending on their built environment and their transportation network, uh, maybe after one ride, after one day, they're like, holy heck, we need to, we need to change our infrastructure. This is horrendous. And that's it. And that's it. So the thing is, is like the, they'll get out there and they'll get scared out of their gourd. Yeah. But they'll also still be like, this would be really fun if I weren't scared out of my gourd. It doesn't, I mean, it literally could take an hour. And so I'm almost just like, I feel like buying a, you know, figuring out a way to buy a fleet of e-bikes, flying them around to climate events, forcing people to get on the bike before they get on some stage and spout some la-di-da about transportation broadly. Yeah. And, and then see if they can be on stage talking about that without going, oh, my goodness, I just rode an e-bike. It's amazing. They're not going to be able to. Right. So I think we have to use this. We're not doing a good enough job influencing leaders. And I want that to be a big part of what I can help move forward. And I think that's that's you're on on, on a, a, a a wonderful track to do just that. You're, you're highlighting uh, people who are being visible, they're leaders in their communities and they're getting out there, they're inspiring stories. And I really do encourage everybody to, you know, head on over, you know, subscribe out on your preferred listening platform of choice. I, I, I know that it's out there on, you know, all the major Everything. platforms, and, yep. you know, that is out there. Uh, it's very professionally done. Um, it's, it's not a long, windy, winding conversation like I tend to have, where I, I welcome somebody in and we chat for 60 minutes. Um, this is very good. You get right to it. You get to the point. And uh, I'm inspired by the work that you're doing. I'm inspired by the work th- of those people that you're profiling. And I, I really, really hope that, uh, you know, this continues to grow. This movement continues to grow. And, you know, people get inspired to be visible about their, you know, climate leadership change and, and living the change that they'd like to see out yeah. there. Thank you so much. The podcast has been 
amazingly fun. The ratings and reviews have been incredible. I also I'm going to put a plug in that for that. If people listen to an episode or two and really like it or get something out of it, please, you know, and I would say that of any podcast, right? So as someone who's new to podcasts, if you like something on a podcast or you like a podcast, please rate and review. I guess Apple and Spotify would be the two places to do that. It helps find new listeners and it helps keep these stories and sort of this inspiration going. And then we have content that we can share and forward to help convince city leaders and all the people that we want to influence to start thinking more about this. So thank you so much for saying those kind words about living change. I, it's just been, it's a wonderful um, experience and the leaders are so inspiring and it's fantastic to, to share them with the world. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll re-emphasize and say that they're very bite-sized. Uh, I tend to listen to the episodes when I'm out on a brisk walk in the neighborhood, just trying to get away from editing my videos here for, for the YouTube, YouTube channel. Uh, so yeah, I mean, very, very approachable. Great. Thank you so much. I really yeah. appreciate it. It was fun talking to you today. Yes, again. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Andrea, again, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's been such oh, a joy and pleasure. You're welcome. Thank you so much, John. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Andrea Learned of the Living Change podcast. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell uh, so that you can customize your notification preferences. And if you are enjoying this content that I'm producing, please consider supporting my efforts by becoming an Active Towns ambassador. It's easy. You can head on over to Patreon and uh, become a patron. Uh, you can buy me a coffee. You can actually leave a tip right here in YouTube by uh, just clicking on the button that's right down below, as well as uh, head on over to the Active Town store and check out some of my fun Streets Are For People swag out there. Uh, again, every little bit helps and is much appreciated. And thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>